And now, please welcome APTA Secretary Treasurer Matthew Tucker. It all starts now. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to the final day of APTIS 2021 Transform Conference and Expo. This has been an absolutely an amazing week. The quality and the variety of the sessions, the inspiring speakers, including me, the amazing scale of the expo floor, it has all exceeded expectations. For me, the real success of this event is that APTA showed us what's next. I hope you feel empowered to implement priorities related to equity, climate change, mobility, economic recovery, and prosperity. These are public transportation challenges and real opportunities for leaving, leading forward. We are all leaving Orlando with tired feet. Can't we agree with that? <laughs> but we're also leaving feeling really rewarded, full of new ideas to take back to our organizations, and with gratitude for, me, for being reconnected with our colleagues. I know for me, and I think for everyone here, being off the Zoom and being able to look at human beings eye to eye and talk has been just an amazing experience. In addition to serving as APTA's secretary and treasurer, I am also the executive director for North County Transit District in Oceanside, California. So for me, from one transit agency leader to another, I want to commend Jim Harrison and the Lynx team for their outstanding work. They have been outstanding hosts, and we thank them for their efforts. I would suspect, since they've been such great, gracious hosts, that we're going to be visiting them again. Please join me in giving Jim and the Lynx team a big round of applause. Before I introduce our keynote speaker today, let's also thank the sponsor of this session, BYD Motors. Please welcome Frank Girardeau, BYD's Senior Director of Communication. Good morning. I bet you all had a great meal last night. I saw a lot of you around. I hope you're as awake as I am. <laughs> um, hey, you know, uh, before I got into the transportation business, I was a, a reporter. And there's, a, there's an old saying in journalism, especially for television journalists, that if you say dog, you got to see dog. So when Johnny loses his dog and the firefighter rescues it, you want to make sure that you show that. Here we have an elephant in the room, though, and it, and it is this. What does transportation and cooking have to do with one another? I thought about this for a long time, and I, found, I think I found the, where this all comes together. It's in the recipe. It's all in the recipe. And, it, it, I, and as you know, I, I work for BYD, and I think we have a recipe. We make electric buses, so we can say that that's a healthy recipe. <laughs> but, but even more than that, it's in the people that work for us. We have 500 union employees at our factory in Lancaster, California. And because we have a community benefits agreement in place, uh, many of those employees are second chance citizens, people who are you know, re-entering the workforce. We also have single parents, veterans, uh, and others who had faced, you know, barriers to, uh, to traditional types of employment. And, and what we're able to do as a result of that is build these big, beautiful buses following a recipe for success. You know, um, the nice thing about this is that it's brought a positive change to our community. Where, where we are in northern Los Angeles County, there was a... There was a double-digit unemployment. And because we've been able to, you know, build and bring people to work, we've brought those numbers down. And even more importantly than that, you can go through our factory 
and talk to people and hear their, their stories about, you know, how when they got out of prison they didn't have skills, how they didn't have a home or a place to stay, and how now not only do they have skills and have their own vehicle, but many are buying their own houses. I think this is where the connection lies. Because when you hear what Chef Jeff has to say, you'll see that there is great redemption available in our world and that um, you know, each of us can play a role in, in making the change. And so I think about you know, the theme here, connect to what's next. And that's what's next for all of us, is bringing forward this, this change in our communities and in our lives. You know, the, the idea of justice and equity is exactly what's next. So anyway, thank you all very much. I don't want to take up any more time for Chef Jeff because you're going to be amazed by what he has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, BYD Motors, for your support. Well, APT always saves the best for last. It's my pleasure to welcome the final keynote speaker of the 2021 Transform Conference. His story is truly remarkable. He began his celebrated culinary career in the unlikeliest of places, federal prison. During his nearly 10 years of incarceration, he discovered an untapped passion for the art of cooking. And that passion became the catalyst that transformed his life. After regaining his freedom in 1996, he worked his way up from dishwasher to celebrity chef. Along the way, he made history by becoming the first African-American chef de cuisine at Caesar's Palace. From prison to a renowned chef, author, television personality, philanthropist, and life strategist, his inspiring journey has been featured on Oprah's Life Class, Good Morning America, The Today, the Today Show, and on and on and on the list goes. Today, he is here to share his story with us. Before he comes out, let's watch his introductory video. What's really profound for me about this next story of Jeff Henderson is that it's never too late to have a wake-up call and that all life is about growing to be who you were most meant to be, the best version of yourself, and that even if it takes a disaster in your life. There's always time until you take your last breath to recognize that you have the power. He's America's fastest rising celebrity chef. His best-selling books are earning him national attention. New York Times best-selling author, Chef Jeff Henderson. His motivational appearances draw thousands of followers. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. Is that were you willing to put in the work to get there? USA Today calls him the high profile chef to watch. What is the most important thing you think you learned about yourself? Why do you think you made it? I made it because I had a dream. I said to myself that I want to be a chef someday. And now, millions of TV viewers across the country are getting a taste of Chef Jeff's dream come true. Hi, I'm Chef Jeff. And today we're making an amazing, healthy crab cake. We gotta start off first with some fresh crab meat and about two tablespoons of roasted red bell peppers, a couple tablespoons of red onion, and a little bit of cilantro. Here's the light sour cream. I'm gonna put the two eggs in here. So I'm gonna go right in here with that crab cake. Woo, you hear it sizzling, you hear it talking to you? There we have, healthy crab cake. I'm Chef Jeff, and I'll see you next time. Finally tonight, our person of the week. He's an ex-convict who's the first to tell you he is not proud of his early years. I truly believe it's my calling to touch the lives of people who feel they have no hope or have no potential to be successful. And then a hero comes along with the strength to carry on And you cast your fears aside And you know you can survive So when you feel like home Please welcome award-winning chef, Jeff Henderson.
great morning, great morning, great morning. Come on, not good enough. I saw y'all out partying last night. Great morning. Yes. The reason why I always say great morning instead of good morning is because everyone in this room is so blessed to have awakened this morning. There's a lot of people across this country and across the world who have had major setbacks in their life and who are struggling today. I thank God for all the opportunities um, that I have received coming out of prison some 25 years ago. I want to thank BYD, the gentleman who was here a little before me, who sponsored me to come here. I'm not in the transportation business. I'm in the chef business. I'm in the transformation business. Coming out of prison 25 years ago, I had an American dream. That dream was the one day, to one day, be able to be in a position to buy my mother a home with a white picket fence. My dream was to go back not just to my community where I've done some wrong, but to go across this country as an example, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, everybody has the power of potential to become that best version of themselves. As I take you on my journey, from the streets to the stove. I want you to sit back for a moment. And I want you to be uncomfortable for a moment. I want you to put yourself in the back seat of a car with the windows rolled down as I take you through the neighborhoods of poverty, where you experience the adverse childhood experiences that so many people experience that eventually leads them to criminalization and ultimately incarceration. As I share my story, if there's anyone in this room who has been directly or indirectly impacted by drugs, I want to stand right here and right now and apologize. I've made some poor choices in my life that I'm not proud of, but I thank God that I lived to turn 57 years of age. So sit back and think about how you as an individual, as an organization, can offer second chances to people who fell short in life. 40 plus years ago, when I was a little boy growing up in South Central Los Angeles, I grew up in a traditional African American home. It was dysfunctional, it was broken. Mother and father divorced when I was young. My mother struggled to raise my sister and I, which is a reflection of many poor, black and brown, underserved communities across this country. And as a little boy who was a dreamer, a little boy who was partial blind in his right eye, who wore Clark Kent style glasses, where the right lens was thick as a Coke bottle, where kids made fun of me. But there was something magical about that lens in my right eye. And so you know, if you haven't heard the term adverse childhood experiences, it's experiences that no human, no young person should ever experience. Born into circumstances, seeing things, hearing things, and experiencing things that shape the mindset and the future and the outcomes of our young people across this country. Adverse childhood experiences 
are broken down like this. Have you ever awakened hungry? Have you ever witnessed your mother in multiple relationships? Have you ever not seen marriage work or family work? For me, I was a little boy who cried when my mother cried, when she struggled, when she came home to drink herself to sleep at night. I was a little homeboy who was frustrated because my mother couldn't figure out the recipe for our family success. It was a struggle for me. We were on welfare. We received government rations, government cheese, government bologna, canned goods and things of that nature. I lived in a community where men that looked like me, who were successful like the African-American man who stood here earlier, but it was the drug dealers, it was the street hustlers. It was the men and women who were doing ungodly, unworldly things in front of young people that began to shape us. Imagine growing up your whole life and never saying good morning mommy or good morning daddy. Imagine opening that refrigerator and looking inside and it's hollow with no choices for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I was a little boy who was excited about going to school. I was a little boy who got to the bus before everyone, every single day, because behind the school bus driver, it was the largest window. And growing up in South Central Los Angeles, in order to get to school, we had to go through middle class America. So here I am, a little boy, with Coke bottle thick lenses in his glasses for month after month, year after year. I saw the American dream. I saw the houses on the hill with the white picket fence. I saw mothers and fathers and families coming out of the front door, manicured lawns, quiet streets with big trees and free of gunshots. So as an imagineer, as a dreamer, I always imagined what was inside of those houses. I knew inside of those houses they had the Sears and Robot washing machine and dryer. I knew there was a double door refrigerator. I knew in the early 1980s, in the late 70s, I knew that those middle class privileged children had choices for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You see, growing up, I wanted it bad. I, I tried to figure out, I tried to understand why some people live different than other people. I began to question my mother. How come they get to live over there and we have to live over here? How come some of these kids have fathers and I don't because many times in adverse childhood experiences, young people of color witness their mothers in multiple relationships. They've seen the sugar daddies, the older men who prey on young, beautiful, poor girls in inner city communities. And we understood that concept of when the sugar daddy came and when he left, mother would have money. We understood the science and the, and the belief behind the power of hustle. Because we knew if our mother didn't hustle, we didn't eat. So as I used to visualize these houses, and I would get to school and I began to question, I never learned in school. I couldn't comprehend what the teacher was talking about. I was so focused on getting that free breakfast, getting that free lunch. I failed throughout public school, mathematics, science, history. Because my teacher, and many teachers in this country who try to educate young people from underserved communities, they don't have that cultural, they don't have that cultural and emotional connection to the students that they're, they're, they're training, that they're teaching, that they're reading to, that they give homework to. And so 
my teacher never connected education to the American dream. Like I went to school, but no one ever told me why. If my teacher would have said, Jeffrey, if you focus on mathematics, science, history, woodshop, and these things, this is the house that you can get. There was no pathway to the middle class. There was no pathway to overcoming and moving out of that poverty mindset. So I was always frustrated because it just didn't work. I was always thinking, how could I help my mother? And many times in black and brown communities, poor mothers of color, they tell their son, you are the man of the house. And when my mother told me that I was the man of the house, I took that as a call to action. I took that as I have to do something to help. I got one A in my life in school was in drafting. It was something about those drafting tables that was on an angle and you had the, the, the big white paper with all the little squares and that little silver device with that number two pencil and you would connect the dots with that T-bar. I got an A in that class, but no one ever paid attention. Everyone focused on where I was failing at versus where I was succeeding at. So as I went through school, I started getting in trouble. I started selling marijuana in school. My mother didn't know what I was doing, but from time to time I would hand her some money because I had a newspaper route, number one candy seller, number one newspaper boy in the neighborhood. I was always hustling, selling Coke bottles and things like that to make money. Because of that vision I had to get a house, to move out of poverty, to live the lifestyle of those folks who lived in the middle class. And so during that period, during that period of my life, it was the drug dealers who became very, very interesting to me. They had the money, they had the cars, they had the homes. And then when I came out of high school, I began to dibble and dabble in different drugs. And eventually I started selling cocaine in the early 1980s. Someone came up with an idea to make cocaine affordable to every demographics of people in this country. It was called crack. And it just showed up in our poor neighborhoods. And we got involved in the drugs. We started selling drugs, destroying our communities, getting indicted, going to prison, building up what we know today as the mass industrial prison complex. When you think about the pipeline to prison, when you think about the neighborhood, the prison pipeline, so many of our young people are in these pipelines based on those adverse childhood experiences, things that they experience, the struggle, poverty, hunger. Many of these young kids who I talk about wind up in the foster care system where they never seen marriage work, where they never seen family work. But that family becomes those guys and those gals in the neighborhoods who begin to show you a better way financially. And when I started selling drugs, I made a lot of money, a part of my life that I'm not proud of. But when I was out there on those streets, I never was violent, I never used drugs, I never carried guns, I never was in gangs. I looked at it as a business. And as I got more and more involved in drugs, I learned some pretty serious business skill sets. I learned how to manage people, I learned how to market, I learned how to uh, budget, I learned how to build strategic relationships like in any business. But I didn't know those terminologies then until I got arrested, indicted by the federal government in 1988. I was cruising home one day, actually it was early in the morning, about two o'clock in the morning. I was driving my car up a steep hill in Spring Valley known as Dictionary Hills. I had achieved my so-called American dream. I had the house built, I had a three-car garage, I had the luxury furniture. I got my mother out of poverty. But what I was blinded to was the impact 
that drugs had in black and brown and poor white communities. So here I am cruising home. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I was a little weary eye, and I came up Cuyamaca Avenue, and I made a left turn on my street. And as I cruise up the street, I noticed there were some vehicles that I thought maybe my neighbors bought some new cars today or something. They were like white vans and Royal Crown, Crown Victoria cars. <laughs> I said, wow, okay, these look like cop cars, right? And then I was still a little weary eyed and I, and I approached my residence and uh, my foot was on the, the brakes. It was still in drive. And I said, something isn't right. That little voice, that intuition said something wasn't right. And as I began to take off, federal agents came all around my car with nine millimeter guns. And subconsciously, that little voice spoke to me, even though the officer never said these words. His nonverbal communication to me says, don't do it. And as I hesitated for a moment, do I step on the accelerator and make my break? Or do I surrender? And as they pointed more and more of those guns at me, that little voice said to me that it's over. Don't do it. They ordered me to put the car in park and exit the vehicle. I exited the vehicle, they handcuffed me, and they walked me to the van. And I was on a van for about 30 minutes heading to the Federal Detention Center. And during that moment, there were flashes of all the things I'd done wrong as a young boy, the times that I lied to my mother, the times that I stole, all the drugs that I had put on the streets, the victims of drugs, the whole nine yards. And as they took me down to the Federal Detention Center, they strip searched me, cavity check, and they put me in a cage. And when I say a cage, I mean a box with steel doors, a key, stainless steel toilet. And for that period of time of 11 months fighting my case, before the jury came back guilty, guilty, guilty 12 times, I knew that my life was over. I knew I was about to serve 10 years to life in prison. I was 23 years old at the, at the time. And so they hauled me off to Terminal Island Federal Prison. And so when I had this setback in my life, and when you think about the setback, that down period is like personally and professionally. During the pandemic, we had to pivot. Our lives were turned upside down. Our businesses were turned upside down. And I had to figure out, what am I going to do? How am I going to survive this 10 years in prison I was about to serve? But while sitting in this cage with a stainless steel toilet, with a bunk bed, a celly, confined under controlled movements, the first time in my life I ever been isolated, there were many thoughts that went through my mind. Times of, there were suicidal thoughts. There were flashbacks of the streets, my family, everything I was separated from. I lost every single thing. And then I had an epiphany over a period of time. And a man brought me a book, a book called Black Men Obsolete, Single Dangerous. And I never read a book before, never owned a book, never valued education never was asked what I want to be in life, never was asked about a dream, never was encouraged, never was exposed, never was around men who looked like me, who were successful, who wasn't drug dealers or gangsters or criminals. But I saw pictures of black men who were successful, who wasn't hanging on street corners. And I began to read some of the passages in this book. And I said to myself, why didn't my school teacher, why didn't the public school system give me literature 
and books that would have built up my self-esteem and told me that I have the power of potential. So this setback for me and for all of us during not just our professional pandemic, but even our personal life, is the recipe for the comeback. And as I begin to read, I begin to shift in the way that I think. And so here I am in prison, serving out this time, and I begin to read books. I went to school and I earned my GED. And when you think about the power of diversity, when you think about inclusion, when you think about biases, when I was in prison, the first time that I ever had a meal or sat at a table with a white guy was in prison. And I was in prison during the time it was called Club Fed. And I met this Wall Street guy who invited me to come to Toastmasters and to share my story. And as I went to share my story and I talked about how, you know, I made a million dollars by the time I was 19 years old and how I controlled you know, the lion's share of the cocaine business in Southeast San Diego. And he was blown away. And he says, Jeff, when you were on the street selling drugs, even though you were a criminal and you were doing bad things, you understood marketing, branding. You understood the power of strategic relationships, distribution, transportation. You knew how to manage the diverse workforce. You were managing people, you understood profit, you understood loss naturally. He said, that was your gift. He said, Jeff, all you have to do is change the product. And the product was me. And these Wall Street guys became very, very attractive to me. And these were like Ivan Bolsky, who I was in prison with, the co-defendant of Michael Milken, the junk bond king. We're talking about the middle 1980s. And then I was hanging around these guys so much I got fired on the job and they put me in food service on pots and pans. So here I'm in the prison kitchen, I realize the inmates in the prison kitchen, they get to eat better than all the rest of the other inmates. So now I'm in here washing dishes and, you know, uh, eating better than everybody else and I'm like, wow, this is a place to be. And then I started helping out the cooks in the prison kitchen, right? And then I started getting really good and, and then um, uh, uh, really good at cooking the food and seizing the food and then um, uh, managing the process to have breakfast, lunch ready every single day for 1,200 convicts, right? And then one of the guys went home and they promoted me to the head inmate cook. Now I was half transformed. I had turned my life around maybe, ah, maybe 75%. I still had a little crook in me. <laughs> so the Wall Street guys were so interesting to me, like I really wanted to get next to them because they taught marketing classes, branding classes, business classes. So now I'm in a prison kitchen, I realize, you know, there's a business here. There's an underground market for goods out of the kitchen. So I started smuggling onions, red onions, and hard-boiled eggs, and chicken, and scraps from leftover chicken and meatloaf to crumble in the, in the top ramen noodle and these nachos. And so I used to buy all the nacho Dorito chips from the commissary because I used to crush them to get that jalapeno cheese flavor that used as a seasoning, right? But, you know, I, I couldn't smuggle enough food out for my customers, right? The Wall Street guys, right? So when I first went to prison, you know, I, I used to wear um, tidy whities right? Y'all know what tidy whities are. Come on, fellas. I hear the ladies. I don't hear the fellas. <laughs> Lady cleans them and buys them for us, right? So when I first went to prison, I had tidy whities on when I had my first strip search with 10 other guys. And one of the older guys I knew, he said, Jeff. I said, hey, man, what's going on? Because I had to learn how to, you know. Y'all knew what was next, right? So after they checked me all over, the guy said, hey, Jeff, man, you can't be wearing tidy whities in prison. I didn't know the rules of prison. I didn't know what underwear you had to wear in prison. He said, man, those, you know, those are called man panties in prison. 
I said, oh, I better go get some boxers. So I went and got boxers, right? So now I'm in the kitchen, and it's time to smuggle my goods out the kitchen. But every time I would try to put something in my pants, it would fall down. And then I would put them in my socks and stuff. So I went back to commissary and got the tidy whities and pulled the boxers over the tidy whities. So I would stuff chicken, eggs, onions, everything to cater to the Wall Street guys because they were coaching me. And then I got really good at cooking. Everybody starts saying, chef, you ought to think about being a chef, right? And so when I said, man, I don't even know what a chef is. I never cooked anything before, but like government cheese and government bologna sandwiches at the broiler underneath the stove on that white Wonder Bread that makes you grow seven different ways. And then so then I, I just started reading and learning and learning how to bake, and then I got released from prison. And when I got released from prison 25 years ago, I realized that my ability to not allow the prison system to incarcerate my mindset was key to my success as a formerly incarcerated citizen. Resilience is at the core of everything. Success, pivoting, mental toughness, that we all had to experience and embrace during this pandemic with our organizations. Come on, losing labor. Gentleman mentioned earlier to me in the back, he lost almost 75% of his labor during the pandemic. What do you do? How do you recover from that? So for me, my resiliency had to be, how am I gonna become a top chef? My dream was to become one of the top chefs, but coming out of prison, I had some issues. Of course, coming out of prison 10 years, you have a few issues, right? I didn't smile. I was pretty buff when I came out of prison. Big chest, big shoulder. And I still had that homeboy prison swag, right? Like somebody shot me in the leg, and I've never been shot before. I've been stabbed before, but I've never been shot before. And so coming out of prison, I had to humble myself. I had to find humility. I had to figure out a strategy for the comeback, to overcome my personal pandemic. And I met my wife in the darkest place on earth when I was in prison. The head cook who taught me how to cook in prison, who took me up under his wings, introduced me to his niece as a, for her to help me transition from a prison to the outside. I had to learn to smile. I had to learn to adjust in mainstream. I had to learn to love again. I had to uh, focus on not being so desensitized because prison desensitizes you over a period of time. I had to learn to relax a little bit. I had to learn to uh, embrace a new culture a culture outside of poverty, a culture outside the hood, a culture outside of prison, because in prison you have to survive. So there, you kind of adapt to that culture and that lifestyle. So the dream for me coming out of prison was to become a chef. But I had to change the perception and, the, and knock down the biases against people who've been in prison, people who've made poor choices in their life based on circumstances, adverse childhood experiences, but ultimately making poor choices because just because you come from poverty doesn't mean you're gonna become a criminal or you're gonna wind up in prison. I made that choice out of desperation to change the financial status of my family because of the struggle and the pain and the suffering that my mother went to struggling every day to raise us. That was my justification. And so coming out of prison and diffusing the prison stigma, I had to build a brand. I knew in order to go in the top culinary world, everything about me had to say brand, brand, brand. I had to start wearing tight pants. Right, successful men wear tight pants, they don't sag their pants, drawers all the way down. And it was difficult for me at first wearing tight pants. But I wanted a pathway to the middle class. I wanted to build strategic relationships with movers and shakers. And so I had to adapt that middle class corporate swagger, right? 
And then so even, even the walk had to change and I had to quit lifting weights. I started investing in my grill. Look at my grill. I started getting my teeth like a successful man have nice teeth. I started getting my hands manicured. I went out and got the trendy eyewear. I clean shaved my face and took makeup to cover my earring hole up because I could not look like the mugshot guy. I knew in order to get access to middle class America, I had to blend in to that culture. I had to get that corporate walk down with the tight pants. Tight pants and tidy whities don't go good together. <laughs> Y'all want to see my corporate walk? <laughs> it took me to change my walk three times to get a job at the Ritz Carlton, the Hotel Bel Air, the L'Hermitage. And so as I came into the cooking world, I built a relationship with this gentleman, Robert Gatsby, who I read about in prison in the USA Today, one of the top chefs in the country. And when I read about this guy, I knew I had to emulate him. I knew that I had to figure out how he got to where he is. So he was the model that I duplicated. See his bald head? His eyewear, clean shaven, he got a handlebar mustache. And I went out and got the Braggart Egyptian cotton chef coat. This is the most expensive chef jacket that money can buy. It's from France. A company called Braggart is made out of Egyptian cotton. And it has a B assembled right here that I call the big B, the Bentley of them all because I knew coming out of prison, a black man who'd never been to culinary school with a prison GED and 27 certificates whose background was institutional cooking, how was I gonna get them to allow me in? And so I was able to rise up from a dishwasher in Beverly Hills to uh, work in, cook in the Ritz Carlton, the Hotel Bel Air L'Hermitage, some of the top restaurants and hotel brands in Los Angeles. In 2001, I set my sight on Las Vegas where the kings of chefs were at, where chefs made great money in some of the big properties. And I went to Las Vegas. Everybody on the Las Vegas Strip turned me down. I went to every single top property. And I didn't want to go to Caesars, because Caesars Palace, I used to be a high roller there during the 1980s with all the prize fights when the boxing ring used to be outside with Mike Tyson, Sugar Ray Leonard, Marvis Hagler had these big prize fights. So it was something, I just didn't want to revisit my past. And so my wife said, honey, you know, you were unsuccessful at landing a job. And I, she said, you got to go to Caesars. I said, I don't want to go to Caesars. And I wind up going to Caesars Palace. And there was a guy named Jim Perello, a chef. He called me in. And he said, Henderson, you ever kill anybody? I said, no, sir. I said, have you, he said, you've never been involved in any violence or kill anybody, right? I said, no, sir. He says, well, can you cook? I said, yes, sir. So they had me go up to banquets, right? I uh, went up to banquets. And, you know, in banquets is when, you know, sometimes you do a lot of those events up there. You know, you know how you go to some conferences and they had a dry salmon and dry chicken, they pull the lid off, ugly plates and stuff. So I said, you know what, I got to show these boys I can really get down because of the biases of people who have been to prison. I didn't look like I've been to prison. I had the braggart coat on and then out of a sudden, all these executives came and they built these tables all around my cook area. They were watching how I moved in the kitchen. They was watching how I had all my mise en place set up here, right? And so I had to cook six courses in one hour. 
And I went to work and I knew all eyes was on me. Hands polished, manicured, chef coat, tight pants on, everything. I had the nice Japanese knives and the whole nine yards, right? And so I busted out one of my third dishes was a duck fat diver scallop, right? And so this is what we have right here. So right, U15, and I seasoned them really well. So they were watching, I was getting real fancy with it, right? Yes, and they were watching every move that I made, right? And so I made sure I seasoned up everything really, really good. And uh, so what I did, I seasoned them, scallops, and I came in the pan. I used a cast iron at that time, right? And then I put those diver scallops in here, right? And I let them sear. They was able to smell that flavor. So with the duck fat, with his great flavor, they was like, man, where does brother learn about duck fat at, right? They don't have duck fat in the penitentiary, right? So I was just studying and studying how chefs really brought flavor uh, to their food, right? And then so I took some andouille sausage and I'm cooked these down just a little bit, right? Just to get that great flavor, that spiciness. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna add a little touch of New Orleans in my cooking, right? And then so I came over here and I got my bell peppers. They was watching my knife skills big time. And so I busted out my fancy knife all the way down to I held the knife like this, all fancy. They was like, wow, Chef Jeff. And I'm just like, you know, doing my julienne, dicing up the bell pepper. They said, okay, that guy got some really nice uh, knife skills, right? Okay, so now the pressure was on. I'm looking right above my glasses there because I wanted to see how they were watching me, what they were studying for. I made sure I kept everything polished and nice and really, really good. So I came over here, so I took the andouille sausage, all that great flavor. Look at this here, yeah. Let me turn it down just a little bit. Then I took a little bit of corn, which is a New Orleans style dish called a mock chew, all right? So we have the corn there. I'm gonna take a little bit of red onion and I'm gonna dice some red onion in there. I like the red onion because it's sweet or if you do the shallots. It was like, man, that boy got some skills, right? I like blew him away. I like, I came to win. I, didn't, I was out of work at the time. My family was home and they were worrying about if I was gonna be able to get a job. And so I said, oh, I'm gonna get this job. And so as I began to continue to cook, they were watching. So scallops are really nice and caramelized right there on the top. Look how beautiful those scallops are, right? And then I just started moving all of my vegetables around, right? So we're gonna cook this down. So now we got the oil, the flavor from the spicy and dewy coming in. And at the time I had got some collard greens, so I went looking out yesterday at Whole Foods. <laughs> they don't have no collard greens in this neighborhood, right? <laughs> so, I, so I got a little bit of rainbow Swiss chard, okay? Yes, yes, all right. And then, so I'm gonna move my onions out the way here a little bit. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add some garlic because I add garlic towards the end only because you don't want your garlic to burn, okay? We're gonna turn that baby down just a little bit, okay? And we're gonna start to move all this great flavor around. We're gonna let that Swiss chard cook down here and we're gonna add a little bit of fresh cracked pepper here. Oh yes. And so we have the spiciness uh, from my Creole seasoning and I can really start to smell that flavor coming up from here. Scallops are cooking good. I'm gonna go ahead and just move them around a little bit. Oh yes, these are look beautiful. Look at those babies. I'm gonna turn them over one more time and then I'm gonna take a little bit of seasoning and put right there on those scallops, right? Beautiful. I'm gonna take a lemon here. I got my lemon going, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I'm gonna add just a little uh, citrus, a little acid here on those scallops. And I wanna make sure those scallops don't stick. So I'm gonna add just a little more duck fat. Oh yes, get your duck fat at your whole foods, your higher end markets. Talk about great flavor, high heat content uh, as well. We're looking good here. I'm gonna go ahead now and I'm gonna chop up my garlic. Oh yeah, look at that. You guys like garlic? Oh yes, 
All right, so we're gonna get some garlic in here, get it nice and minced up. So these executives were watching me out of the corner of their eye. And I was like, man, I think I got them on the hook right now. Right, they're like, this, <laughs> this guy is pretty cool, right? He's getting down, he has the look, he has the style, he has the finesse. Go ahead and put that garlic right there. Let that kind of cook down just a little bit. Oh yes, look at that. Oh yeah. Talk about some great flavor here. I'm gonna do a quick taste, right quick and see where we are. I'm gonna drop that heat down just a little bit. So I was getting real fancy, right? All the way how I touched the pan, everything was like, oh yeah, oh yeah. I was doing some here with some bam, some Bobby Flay type of stuff, right? Mmm. Mmm. A little more heat. A little bit of Cajun Creole seasoning. I'm gonna go ahead and look at this. Oh yeah. So when you talk about under pressure, you talk about pivoting, what's next? I wanted to work at Caesars Palace, one of the top properties in Las Vegas and iconic all around the world. So I had all my plates over there set up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come here. Then I'm gonna plate. Look at that. Oh yes. We have that andouille corn mock chew. They were watching me, how was I? It was like, it's a bad boy right here, right? This guy come out of the hood and he's been in prison and, oh yeah, look at that. Now we're gonna take that scallop, lay that baby right there, look at that. I like to cook my scallops medium. Aren't those scallops beautiful? Oh yeah, look at that. All right, so I'm gonna come back here. I got a little pear. Habanero sauce. I made in my room last night. I gotta leave $50 for the maids. I was in there cooking. Oh yeah, look at that. I'm gonna bring some nice little heat. Oh yeah. I got one more to do here. And then we got somebody, some special people here that's gonna come up. All right. Let's welcome to the stage Ann Derby, Kevin. And Enos, up here to the table here. Oh, yes. All right. We're going to put a little bit of tea tendrils, pea tendrils, right there on top. Look at this. Six courses in one hour. Look at that, you guys. What do you think about that? All right. Great morning, great morning. Welcome here to our little kitchen. Good morning, All right. good morning, Chef. All right, good? Good morning. Good My morning. pleasure, great morning. Good morning. Okay, so I'm gonna let you hold the microphone right. right there. We're gonna have some content. So I want you guys to like open up your, your napkins there. We're gonna do a little taste here. Let me see if I can get a little essence of something on here. You know, I like a little sweetness uh, with savory. So I think we're gonna add just a little bit of honey. Give a little sweetness there with that savoryness, all right? So we're gonna come here, we're just gonna drizzle. There's a little sweetness on there, right? It was like, man, this Chef Jeff, man, he was like off the chain, right? So we're gonna get some, yeah, beautiful. You guys got a little bit of water right there. All right, we're gonna add a little more honey right here. I'm gonna get a little sticky on you. You like those colors? Yes, the what colors you, are wonderful. What do you think about that? Put that on microphone. I want everybody yes. to hear how wonderful the Chef colors Jeff are is, right? Fabulous. Okay. Everything is just melding together. All right, beautiful. And I got wine right here too. If you guys want to have a little bit of a uh, Riesling, I like to pair a little sweet uh, Riesling with this. Sometimes I put a little pear chutney uh, right on top as well. So bon appetit. Bon appetit. Let me know what you think. Go ahead. Mm. Yes. So during this time I was fighting uh, I was at the critical point in between jobs, like I had to get this job. 
uh, depended on me. And so once I finished that final dessert, they asked for six courses. I gave them seven courses, which was oh. a donut tempura sauce. Are they interrupting Chef's talk right now? Okay, uh-oh. Okay. I'm so sorry y'all can't taste this, but this is good. <laughs> this is good. Oh, My goodness. Geez. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think about the flavor? Talk a little bit about the flavor. I'm tasting the andouille sausage with a little bit of that habanero, and I'm not a spicy girl, but this is off the chain. Wow! It comes to the back of your palate mm. on your mouth and just hits you right as you're swallowing going down. Wow! Fabulous! Just now, absolutely fabulous. She's fancy dancy, huh? With those words. <laughs> yeah. I, when I'm I came, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. When I came out of prison, I didn't even know what a palate was when I came out of prison. <laughs> right? Go ahead, sir. Well, chef, I'm gonna be a little bit simpler. It is just very good. I am thoroughly enjoying it. It is just not, the spice isn't there just for spice, but it actually adds to the flavor. And scallops to me is like one of the hardest things to cook. And I'm so impressed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Thank for you. letting me experience this. Well, first of all, let me just say your message was amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much My for pleasure. sharing. Um, but secondly, the only way I know how to say it is, is like a party in my mouth. Yes. Uh -oh. Just amazing, yeah. amazing. Okay. Well. And scallops are my favorite, and I've never had anything this good. So wow. thank you so much. My pleasure. And you know, one of the biggest challenges for me was pivoting from, you know, Southern cuisine and New Orleans cuisine that I was raised on with my grandparents, and then going to prison, eating top ramen noodles for mm. 10 years, and meatloaf, and biscuits, and gravy. And so I had to really educate myself. So I had to be very resilient in that whole process to becoming a chef, understanding flavors, texture, technique, from smell to touch to visual, and things of that nature, even plating. Uh, yes. My style of plating food as well, you know? You eat with your eyes as well. Absolutely. It, you know, you kind of think back too sometimes on why we come to conferences and yes. events like this, yes. right? Is to learn, right? To elevate our game so we can figure out like what's next. Right. And then so for me, is for many years I had to, I spent all of our family money going to restaurants, mm. you know, going to food shows and events because I had to learn about the China, the different ingredients from foie gras, all the different types of seafood. And it really kind of helped me prepare myself for the next chapter of my life. You know, and for you folks out there, you know, this was just supposed to be a taste. They're like, they're up here throwing down. I think they're bringing some chairs. They're going to be asking for a second course here soon. You know, I, I, I think I may have some of my man over there is just like really throwing down. Wow. I'm eating all night. Yes. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go ahead and finish talking a little bit. You guys go ahead, and I have a special gift uh, for you all as well. So during this time period, uh, I'm watching these executives. The pressure was on. I was sweating bullets. But I had so much finesse how I dressed the table all the way down to having the herbs and the different type of ingredients that was not indigenous to the African-American culture. So I was very strategic. When I wrote my menu and the ingredients that I selected did not reflect my childhood. I had to show that, I had to diffuse, I had to deflect the biases of what these guys probably thought I was going to do because they didn't know about my menu. They didn't know what I was gonna cook. And so I came in, I laid out the six courses, seven courses in one hour, and I got offered the position of assistant chef at an Italian restaurant called Terrasa. Yes. And then, so I'm working at the Bellagio. Right? I'm working at Caesar's Palace. I got promoted within four months as the first African-American chef de cuisine uh, at Caesar's Palace, the same place I used to be a bad boy. So imagine coming full circle uh, in your life, right? And everyone had said I couldn't get a job, I wouldn't get a job, but I had to prove myself. And eventually, I worked around at the Hard Rock Hotel, where one of your colleagues, MJ Maynard, uh, who is over the transit uh, uh, company there in Las Vegas, yes. right? Yes. MJ Maynard, right? Yes. Uh, who used to be an executive at the Hard Rock Hotel Food and Beverage. And she gave me a second yeah. chance. Yeah. Yes. Her prior life before she came into this industry, you guys are in, she was an executive over Food and Beverage. And she looked beyond my record and hired me based on what I cooked, you know. And so my, my original dream coming to Vegas was to work at the Bellagio. 
the big B, the Bentley of them all that matches the B on the brag guard, right? Yes, yes. And so uh, I had to change my walk like three times to get at the Bellagio Hotel, but I finally got the job there. And uh, within like six months, I was promoted to the first African-American executive chef yes. running a $30 million restaurant, right? And then one day, the, hey, thank you, wow, wow. And then the phone rang, and it was an agent from New York, a literary agent. He says, uh, Chef Jeff, um, I heard your story of a powerful story of resilience, you know, all these fancy words again. And he says, I would love to help you write a book. Do you want to write a book? I said, I kind of thought about it some years ago. And he says, can I come out and meet you? So we came out, we wrote a proposal for the book called Cooked, right? And uh, after I wrote the book Cooked, I'm going to give you guys a copy of all my books. This is See It, Be It. And this is the book here that Oprah heard about. And she called me to the big stage. And I was nervous when I went on Oprah. Let me tell you, I was sweating bullets, right? I thought she was going like, uh, 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 for my past. And so I was very nervous and I couldn't concentrate. And she made me feel so comfortable when I came out there. And I, she really didn't talk a lot about my dark days. It was about resilience, people who never give up. And when you think about the organizations, what you guys do, the pivot you had to do during the pandemic, when I walked out on that floor and saw the amazing product and folks from all over the world out here, I'm like, man, the transit industry is like huge. And I used to, you know, catch the bus. You know, when you think about what you guys do, it's so important, especially to underserved people yes. and in underserved communities. Growing up in Los Angeles, once the metro system was called RTD in LA. And we caught that bus many a times. We got the paper transfer. It's all fancy it's on there now. Yeah, apps and all kind of there stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so we recently, you know, took our kids, uh, we take them on field trips and we go on public transportation and stuff as well. So I want to thank you guys for coming up. And I'll see you guys afterwards and I'll sign those books for you, huh? Yes. Thank you. Let's give it up for our guests, right? Yes. So now. I'm on Oprah, I'm like, how is this happening to a homeboy who done so many wrong things in his life? And when I look back at my life and how I got to this stage today, it was because I owned my past and I stopped blaming everyone, my circumstances, my mother being in poverty, for the choices I made, I owned it, that I made a choice to do what I done. And I paid my debt to society, uh, serving nearly 10 years of my life in prison. But paying that debt wasn't over with, because God had a bigger plan for me. It wasn't about me being a chef, and as I question myself today, was I really supposed to be a chef? Or was the road to chefdom was part of my journey for the biggest stage of my life? In the biggest stage of my life, Oprah Winfrey gave that to me. And after I was on Oprah, two hours after I was on Oprah, the phone rung again. I'm in New York. Um, I just came off interviewing with Gail King. Because, you know, when you get on Oprah, you got to do Gail King. When you go on Gail King, you got to go on Oprah. They're homegirls, right? So they make sure everybody gets on each other's show. And the phone rang again. So I have my corporate voice on when I answer my phone. I'm still an executive uh, at the Bellagio. But I was on leave to promote the book. The phone rang. Ding, 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 ding. I said, hello, Chef Jeff. May I help you? Um, hey, Chef Jeff, what's going on, man? This is Will Smith. And I said, okay, uh, who's playing on my phone? I'm still trying to stay corporate, trying to keep that hood voice, you know, in the back pocket. And then my agent came on and said, Jeff, Jeff, this is like Will Smith, Big Willie from Philly. Right? Then I got real cool again. What's up, Will? Yeah, man, what's up, Will? Hey, man, what's happening? So I got rid of the wall, came back, and pants went down a little bit. I got real cool, walking like I got shot too, you know? And Will was like, hey man, I just watched you on Oprah. He says, I would love to meet you. I said, oh, man, I would love to meet you. He says, well look, I'm up in Brooklyn filming I Am Legend, right? And I said, okay. I said, you know, I heard about the new movie coming out. They brought me up to the set of I Am Legend. So, you know, coming from the streets, coming from prison, you know, we're, 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 we're analysts. So we observe, we watch every, we got our eyes behind her. You know, but in prison, you got to have eyes behind your head, everything, you know. And I walked and Will had a trailer 
maybe twice, I mean, as long as this stage. And I walked in, it was two story. He had a virtual golf course in there. Everything was like sick. And then I'm looking all around, casing the place out. And I saw copies of my book all around. I said, hmm, I wonder what they want with Chef Jeff. And then so all the, Will wasn't in there. His family was there. All these agents and producers start coming in. Hey, Chef Jeff, how you doing? Fist bumping, handshaking. And then Will came in about 45 minutes later. And he just like heaped love on me and said, man, I'm so proud of you. I love your story. I was like, wow. He said, man, what do you think if I made your life story into a movie? I was like, a movie? I said, why would you want to make my life? I was a drug dealer. He said, yeah, you was a drug dealer, but a lot of people have sold drugs. But what's important and powerful about your story is you got on the path to redemption and you transform your life, and you discovered your gift, the one thing that you do extremely well, and you took that gift, and what resiliency, and humbleness, and the relationships that you built, you are an example to little black and brown boys everywhere, right? And then I'm like, I didn't really look at it like that, because I was just working in the kitchens, and then, you know, after, uh, 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 they, they made an offer to my agent, to my agency on the life story, so we sold the rights of Cook to Will Smith and Sony Columbia. Then a week later, phone ring again, hello, Chef Jeff, corporate again, it was Bob Tushman, head of Food Network, and then I got the Food Network show, they gave me a carte blanche to do anything, right there, prime time with Bobby Flay, Guy Fieri, Rachel Ray, and I said, you know, all of this that's happening to me, all this favor and all these blessings, is not about me. It's about positioning. Positioning me to go back into the communities that my generation of the 1980s played a detrimental role in, the fixed the wrong. And at that period, I understood that. And I wasn't selfish where I wanted to go in and be like, you know, the typical chefs, I'd probably still be on Food Network today, selling product. Like, hi, my name is Chef Jeff, and welcome to What's Cooking with Chef Jeff. We got our all car pads here. We got amazing ingredients. We're getting ready to go to commercial break. Don't turn that down. We'll be right back with Chef Jeff. I told Mr. Tushman three days after they made me an offer, I said, I want to do a show called The Chef Jeff Project. And the Chef Jeff Project was a docu-reality series where I took troubled kids off the street. And I launched a catering business with troubled kids. And these kids had come from foster care, adverse childhood experience, black, brown, white, from drug addiction to uh, a system impacted. And it gave me an opportunity to help rebuild the workforce and educate companies and organizations about the immersion of formerly incarcerated people into the workforce. And so with that opportunity on the Food Network, it gave me the platform during the pandemic to launch a nonprofit 501c3 in Las Vegas, where we serve underserved youth in the community from foster care system, kids who have been sexually, mentally, physically abused, kids who come from underserved communities that are high functioning autistic, and kids who find food interesting to them. So it's where we use food as a therapeutic tool to inspire young people to deal with the trauma based on my lived experience and things. And we have been able to turn kids' lives around young people and get them on jobs and on a pathway to livable wages and to the middle class. And so, when, thank you. And so in closing, when you think about why transportation matters, MJ Maynard, who is, to me, is iconic, because she gave me a second chance before she even came in this industry. And she put me ahead of a multi-million dollar gourmet room steakhouse at the Hard Rock Hotel in Las Vegas that she oversaw. With no culinary degree, never taken a cooking class a day in my life, she believed in me. And she gave me that chance and why I do what I do. So when I launched the Chef Jeff Project, a, a family-funded, you know, we're a self-funded program uh, organization, she heard about that. 
and she came down to visit us in Northtown, one of the most dangerous poverty communities in Las Vegas, and she gave us a grant to give us bus tickets for me to move my young people around the city. So kudos to what you all do, yes. And so, in closing out, I want to say that I'm honored to be here to share my story and to say to each and every one of you, the big fight is almost over now, the pandemic. Now it's time to not only get our personal lives together, but even our professional lives. We've all pivoted, we've all made the shift, we all made the changes, and we learned great, valuable lessons. And it feels so good to be back live in front of people again and not on those silly cameras and them silly Zoom calls, you know? And so, in closing out, I want to say when you go back to your community, make a difference. Create your legacy by providing second chances to folks like me who served time in prison. And I want to say to you, you know, there's 700,000 men and women coming out of the prison system every year. Imagine if we invested in just 10% of that population, which would be 70,000 people who want a second chance, who have an opportunity, who are coachable. And when you recruit these folks and you develop them and you treat them with dignity, we are some of the most loyalist people. And it's not like we're, you're going to retain us because we don't, it's not like we have a lot of options for jobs. So when we get those second chances, we stay with them. You know, and we bring loyalty. And I know many of you in your line of work, you guys do that. So once again, blessings to everyone. God bless you guys, and thank you so much for hanging in here this morning with us. Thank you. Wow, let me catch my breath. That was moving. Chef Jeff, you're fantastic. What an inspiration of hope, of what's possible, realizing one's potential, and all about food, right? And when you sat this morning with us, you said, oh, we're going to hear about a chef. We're going to hear about food and transit. What's that connection? Amazing. What an amazing story, because we're all people, right? And we all care about our lives, our neighbors, our friends, our community. That's what we should be focused on, certainly our families. Uh, that was just fantastic. And I'm grateful for the Chef Jeff for sharing with us his story, telling us his story in such a captivating way. Um, we're blessed by that and inspired to relate it to what we do in our own colleague, MJ Maynard. How about that connection? It is a small world, as we say, right? Who would have known? Las Vegas, the chef, Chef Jeff, MJ Maynard, public transit, somehow coming together. What an amazing, amazing morning. Thank you all for participating and our colleagues who are up here, right? Inez and Kevin and Ann, they didn't want to leave, right? They thought they were eating brunch. They were into brunch. We had breakfast, they were into brunch. They didn't want to go. Um, well. What a great way to conclude our Wednesday morning session. Of course, we've got some great educational sessions that continue here the rest of the morning and early afternoon, about 12.15. And of course, many of you may want to make one more round at Expo. I would encourage you to do that. Again, our business members really put, it, put in a lot of effort and time and money to put on the exhibits, and they're fabulous. You know, someone remarked to me last night, and I said, you know, you're absolutely correct. They said, it's not just an expo and a trade show. For transit, that's a technology show, right? You go around, you saw all these startups and small companies who are doing terrific things uh, to advance our industry. So, so please take a moment, if you can, and take that in as well. Well, let me uh, conclude here by saying I want to thank our host, System Links, 
Uh, it's CFO, uh, CEO uh, Jim Harrison and the Lynx team. They've done just a magnificent job of hosting us here. And thank you again uh, to Lynx for all that they've done to host us. And we also always look at what's next. And what's next here is our next conference, next annual conference, next transform conference, and it will be in Seattle. King County Metro will be our host. Our good friend and colleague, Terry White, who was here, uh, I think he had to return home, but he was here for the bulk of the conference and expo. He will be our host. We talked last week, and they are excited at King County Metro of hosting APTA and having us all return to what's a beautiful city and lots to learn and see from the Seattle system. So, uh, with that, maybe we can pause here and get a little teaser about the video uh, that they have to show us as we begin to think and prepare for our meeting next year in Seattle. All right, we go from one beautiful city to the next, next October in Seattle. Have a great rest of your day, and please, safe travels. Thank you for joining us this week. It's been an incredible time. Thank you to our business members for their terrific exhibits. Thanks to all of you for making the decision to be with us here in Orlando. We love you. Stay safe. Take care.